What's up, Project Church? I want to welcome you back to another week of Church Online. I know you all are anticipating the announcement, like, when are we gathering again? Um, we're calling it our regathering plan, and so I want to ask you to stay tuned to the end of the message. At the very end of today, we're going to give you um, an update as to what regathering is going to look like for us as a church with the schedule and everything. But today, I want to jump in. I want to share with you from God's Word. We're continuing a series called Marked by Jesus where we are on a two-year journey walking through the book of Mark verse by verse. I hope you've been enjoying this series. We've been in it the last few weeks. And I want to jump in here today. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 8. I'm going to be reading verse 22 through 33. So let's just jump right in today. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So I want to share with you from this text a message that I've entitled, I see, but. I see, but. And so the, the primary text or the verse I want to focus on, the key verse here, is when Jesus you know, first touches this blind man and he says to him, do you see anything? And it says that he looks up and he says, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Now, a couple weeks ago, um, we had a little quarantine social distancing party with some friends at a park. It was a farewell party for a friend of ours that was going away for a few months. And uh, so my wife was communicating with the wife and they said to her, they sent her a text and said, meet at Hagen, right? And my wife saw Hagen Oaks and assumed Hagen Oaks golf course. She thought we were meeting at the golf course and it was going to be a hangout there. And, um, but in the text, it also said, bring bikes and, you know, gloves and balls and we'll ride and play and, and all this on the grass. And I'm sitting there thinking like Hagen Oaks is a driving range and a golf course. There's nowhere to ride bikes. There's nowhere to you know, play sports, to throw balls. And I asked my wife, I said, are you sure that it's Hagen Oaks? Because this just doesn't make sense to me. She said, yes, I'm sure. It's Hagen Oaks. I know what I'm doing. I've been talking with her. I said, okay. We got in the car. We're about to leave. And I just, I felt wrong about it. You know how we husbands, we just have intuition. And, uh, and so I just, I said to her again, are you sure? Like, why don't you text her just to make sure and say to her, Hagen Oaks golf course, question mark. She's like, Caleb, I'm sure it's Hagen Oaks just drive. So I drove because I've been there many times um, and I drove to Hagen Oaks. We pull up and we see no one there. Um, we're looking around. We can't find anyone. So I tell my wife, why don't you call her? She calls her. And on the phone, I hear her say, oh, we're at Hagen Park, which Hagen Park is five minutes from our house. Hagen Oaks is 25 minutes from our house in the other direction. And so I... Uh, proceeded to accost my wife verbally uh, because she was so sure, but she actually wasn't right in this moment. And uh, once I calmed down, I asked for forgiveness because I overreacted. We drove 25 minutes, got to the party, everything was good. It wasn't that big of a deal. But I think that this instance is something that a lot of us can relate to. We're like, we're so sure, but are we really sure? And I kept saying to my wife, like, you say you're sure, but are you really sure? Maybe you should check in. Maybe you should make certain that this is the right location that we're going to. 
And I say this to you because I think that a lot of us, many of us, we see, but we don't really see. And what I mean is we don't have complete and correct spiritual vision. And I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about myself. You see, I wonder how many of us are used to seeing men like trees spiritually. That's what this blind man says to Jesus. He says, I see, but the men are like trees. And, it, and what the reality is, is he can see, but he can't really see. He sees shapes, but he can't see details. And some of us, I think, are walking through this Christian life and we see, but we don't really see. What I mean is our spiritual vision is blurred. And at the end of the day, every one of us has blurred spiritual vision in some areas of our life. That's what happens with God is when he comes and he saves us and we come into salvation with Jesus, like we're changed, our hearts are made right. And yet the process of becoming more like Jesus, of drawing closer to Jesus is just that, a process. And what I've realized is that our vision in some areas of our life, in a lot of areas of our life, is blurred. We see, but we don't really see. And so today, I want to dig into this passage. I want to dig into this text because what I believe is that God wants us to have correct spiritual vision, 2020 spiritual vision for our lives. But most of us are walking through, we're like we love Jesus, we're Christians, but our vision is blurred. Spiritually, we aren't seeing, we aren't seeing clearly, and God wants us to have complete, uh, perfect spiritual vision, but it's a process. So let's, let me just set the, the stage for this text, Mark chapter 8. We've been walking through this book of Mark, but this is a divide in the gospel of Mark. This actually marks the midway point. Um, we are halfway through the gospel of Mark. And for eight chapters, Jesus has been establishing who he is. He's been establishing like, this is who I am. I am Jesus, and, and this is what I'm about, right? Th that's what he's been establishing for eight chapters. And it culminates with this moment and this question that he then asks the disciples of who do people say I am? But then he goes on, he says, but also who do you say that I am? You see, at this moment, they are only six months away from Jesus going to the cross. The last miracle he did um, this is the last miracle he does at the Sea of Galilee. And so if, if you don't know a lot about Jesus' ministry, I just want to like lay out the, the groundwork for what's been happening. For nine months to a year, he starts in Judea or the southern part of Israel, ministering, preaching, teaching. Then for a year and a half, he's doing a Galilean ministry uh, along the seas of, around the Sea of Galilee. Now he still went to Jerusalem here and there. They still took a few short trips to other places. But predominantly, they were hanging around um, the Sea of Galilee, ministering all along the shores, around in different towns on the Sea of Galilee. He's done thousands of miracles, and this is the last one he does in Galilee. And the Pharisees, as you guys know from last week, they just asked for a sign, and Jesus, is he's done with that. He now, for the next six months, is going to prepare his disciples for his journey to the cross. And at first glance, we see something unique here where Jesus didn't actually completely heal a man. In fact, this is one of the only miracles we see where it's like a partial miracle, and then he completes it fully just a few moments later. And, and I was thinking about this because at first glance, we're like, man, Jesus, he like, could he not completely heal the man? And this entire chapter is about spiritual blindness, not just physical blindness, Jesus actually shifts gears and asks the disciples this question. And, and even before that, when, when they were on the boat and they keep asking about the bread and talking about the bread and Jesus is like, do you still not see? Do you still not understand? What he was doing is this whole chapter, he's saying, look, people, including the disciples, are spiritually blind. The Pharisees, the scribes, even the disciples are spiritually blind. And he says to them in verse 21, he says, do you not yet understand. And it's actually interesting because he's been with the disciples to this point for two and a half years, ministering, teaching, preaching, performing miracles. And he's like, still two and a half years later, do you guys still not get it? 
Proverbs 29, 18, I think is a great uh, scripture to kind of set the groundwork for this passage too. In the King James Version, it actually says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And in the Message Version, it says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he is doing, then they are most blessed. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that without correct spiritual vision, we're going to stumble through life. We're going to struggle through life. We're actually going to miss out on the blessings that this life has. But when we begin to, to clean out our eyes, when we allow God to heal the spiritual blindness that is in us, because it can't come from us or our strength or our wisdom or our knowledge or us studying more. No, it has to come from God. When he begins to, to focus everything and realign everything in our eyes spiritually, when we can see, then we'll walk in the fullness of the promises that he has for us. Then we'll walk fully blessed. Then we'll have a vision for our lives. So this is clear that God is still a healer. But God doesn't just heal us physically. He also and more often heals us spiritually. And so today, I want to talk to us about the spiritual healing that we all need. And I'm talking about you I'm talking about me. I'm talking about everyone that can hear this, everyone in this world, every Christian out there. We need a spiritual healing. We need God to give us spiritual vision, a clarity of spiritual vision. So the title of my message is I see, but, because I just want to tell you, you see, but honestly, not really. Like I see, but honestly, not really. I don't see completely clearly. I don't see in the exact way that God wants me to see. And that's why I need him every single day to help my vision become clear. In fact, every morning I find I wake up and my vision has gotten a little foggy. Why? Because my flesh ra rises up even in my sleep. And throughout my day, my flesh can cloud my vision spiritually. And that's why we need God to give us clear vision spiritual. We need a touch from him. So today I want to talk to you about the secrets to really seeing. The secrets to really seeing. I don't know about you, but I want to see. I want to see clearly. All right. There was a great song. I can see clearly now. The rain is gone. I want to see clearly in my life, but not just physically, all right? 20-20 vision is great. Some of you all out there have 20-20 vision. Good for you. Some of you out there wear glasses to give you 20-20 vision. Contacts. You, you, you find a way to make it work. You got LASIK. But at the end of the day, like, physical vision is great. But spiritual vision is what we need as followers of Christ. So the secrets to really seeing spiritually, number one, is you have to come to Jesus. And I know this is the Sunday school answer, right? It, it's Jesus. It, it always and only is Jesus. And yes, before you can see spiritually, you got to come to Jesus. Not come to, to, to the center of yourself. Not, not come to this, um, you know, understanding of the universe and, 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 and greater knowledge of what philosophers. No, you got to come to Jesus. Verse 22. Let's dig back into this text. It says, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought him, him being Jesus, a blind man, and begged him to touch him. They bring him to Jesus. When a person is physically blind, how many know it's evident? I mean, I, I've known some blind people in my life, um, had some blind people come to our church. I've been around blind people, and it's evident when people are blind. But when people are spiritually blind, it's not as obvious. And that's why some of you out there is like, man, this is going to be a great message. You're already thinking about the person that needs to hear this. You're like, I mean, they're a Christian, but barely, you know, like they're a Christian, but they don't really see clearly uh, if you know what I'm saying. But that's the challenge of spiritual blindness is we don't always even see it in ourselves. And I wanted to tell you, like, you have some spiritual blindness in your life. It doesn't matter if you've been following Jesus for 25 years or for 25, you know, minutes, 25 months. You have some spiritual blindness in your life, and that's why you need to come to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us this. In their case, 
The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And the God of this world, the, the lowercase God, is referring to Satan. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that the enemy wants to blind you to what is coming. He wants to blind us to the future, blind us to eternity. If this man who is brought to Jesus doesn't come to Jesus, guess what? He's going to be blind for the rest of his life. And that's a terrible thing for anyone to experience. People have walked through this entire life blind. But I want to tell you something. If we don't come to Jesus, we will be blind spiritually for the rest of our life and for the eternity that follows this. And let me tell you, this life may seem long, but it's short. And eternity is long. And that's why we need to come to Jesus. Why? Because we need to be spiritually clear. We need a spiritual vision, and that only comes from Jesus. If you're going to really see, you have to come to him. So what does Jesus do? He takes him by the hand. It actually tells us in the very next verse, it says he takes the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes, he asked him this question. When, there, when you come to Jesus, there will be a moment of just you and Jesus. You see, I think there's a lot of people out there who, who are relying on the faith of their husband, the faith of their wife, the faith of their friends, the faith of their parents. And they said, well, I mean, I, I've grown up in it or I'm married to this person, so I'm in it. No, the, the time has to come for every one of us when we have to decide on our own to come to Jesus or not. The secret to seeing is coming to Jesus. And someone out there, you've been relying on the faith of someone else. You've been holding on to the coattails, riding on the back and say, well, I'm, I'm in it because of them. And I want to tell you, the moment comes where Jesus grabs you by the arm, grabs you by the hand and says, it's you and me. Are you in or you're out? And some of you, today is that moment. You need to come to Jesus to see clearly. And you've wondered why you feel like your vision is is murky and you've wondered why you don't feel blessed in this life and you wondered why you're bitter and angry and unhappy and have unforgiveness in your life until you come to Jesus you cannot see clearly so the secret to really seeing first is you have to come to Jesus I've got to come to Jesus you've got to come to Jesus second the secret to really seeing is admitting that you're blind and I know this sounds kind of obvious, but, but if we can't admit that we're blind, how can we receive the healing that we need? And some of you out there, you've been following Jesus for so long that you don't think you're blind anymore. You don't think that spiritually you have any blind spots in your life. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how long you've been with Jesus. We all need to recognize and admit that we are are blind. I'm blind spiritually. I wake up in the morning and I realize I'm blind. And if every time somebody cuts me off on the road and I react in a way I shouldn't, let me tell you, I realize I'm still blind. And admitting that is the beginning of the process of receiving the healing from Jesus that we need. So what does Jesus do in verse 23? He does something kind of nasty. Um, he spits on his eyes, the text tells us. And I think some of you saw this, you're like, dang, that's kind of crazy. He took the blind man by hand, led him out of the village. When he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Now, just to set the stage for this, uh, Jesus did a similar thing in a chapter, a chapter earlier when he touched his spit to the man's tongue who was mute. He actually like, you know, takes his finger, spits on his finger, and then touches the man's tongue, and, and the man is able to speak. And... Uh, for us, that seems nasty, especially in the middle of this. Y'all are like, what about COVID? You know? um, but, but in that day, there was this common belief that saliva had medicinal or healing purposes. I want you to think about it, and they were very superstitious in this day. Like, what do you do the second you cut your finger or, or burn your finger? What do you do? You take it, and you put it in your mouth, right? And you, you suck on your finger. That's like your initial reaction as a human being. And so in this day, they believe like spit 
had healing or medicinal powers to it. So many theologians have argued that this would have actually activated the man's faith. That when Jesus spit on his eyes, the man's faith would have been activated like, wow, he really believes he can heal me, heal me because he's actually spitting on me and there's power and healing medicinal purposes in spit. And I just want to tell you this because faith is a huge component of receiving a miracle. And we see this throughout scripture. In chapter six, we see Jesus can do no mighty works in his hometown of Nazareth. Why? Because of their lack of faith. We have to go to God with faith. And if you want a big miracle, if you want to see spiritually, you have to go to God with faith and say, God, I believe that you can open my eyes. And so you have to acknowledge and admit you're blind, and then you have to go to God and, and believe that he can open up your blind eyes. He can heal that which is broken. Verse 24, what happens? Jesus says, do you see? He says, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Now, I just want you to imagine that this man, he's been blind, and we actually believe that he, was, he wasn't born blind, um, but he, he had seen earlier in his life and somewhere along the way had been blinded. And I want you to imagine that if he had said no, like, I still can't see. Like, what if he had gotten frustrated with Jesus because he... he he thinks Jesus is going to heal him and Jesus spits on him, but then he can't completely see. In fact, his vision is still blurred. I mean, he sees men, but they're like trees. They're blurred. He can't really make out details. He can't see faces. Imagine if he had got frustrated in this moment because his full healing hadn't come in this, mo in this exact moment and he had said no. What if he had responded that way? I still can't see. If that had been his response, this man, if he had responded, he would have walked through life bitter and seen trees everywhere he went. And I'm guessing this would not have been um, the life that he wanted. You see, what I found is that people often get frustrated with God when their answer doesn't come immediately or how they think it should come. And I wonder how many people have partial sight because they got frustrated that Jesus didn't immediately give them full sight. And instead of responding and saying, wow, Jesus, you've, you've opened my eyes a little bit. I see a little bit. Like, I think more people respond. They go, no, I, I'm still blind. I can't see details. I can't see faces. What's wrong with you? And then they walk away from Jesus or away from God with partial sight and partial blindness. And I think some of you even out there have been walking with a partial healing because the timing wasn't what you thought it should be. And I just want to challenge you that you would come back to Jesus and say, I'm going to be patient for my healing. I'm going to wait on my miracle. I know that it's a process sometimes that God is walking me through because maybe he's teaching you something through this season of tree seeing and the details and the faces are coming later. We have to admit we don't see as we should. And I think so many Christians are walking through this life and they think they're really spiritual and really holy. They're like the Pharisees. They think they know it all. They got it all. They think they've got this Jesus thing on lock. And, and some of us are more comfortable with the tradition that we grew up in than what the Bible is actually saying. We know Jesus but we need to grow. I just want to challenge you. Like you know Jesus. You grew up in the faith but you still need to grow. Coming to Jesus is a journey. Growing in Jesus is a journey. Some of us are stuck where we started and we still see trees, but God wants us to see clearly. God wants you to see clearly. He wants me to see clearly. And we have to acknowledge that we don't see clearly. We have to acknowledge and admit, God, I'm still blind spiritually. I don't know everything. I don't see everything. Admit it. And I just want to be honest with you guys, because what I'm seeing right now, like there's been some terrible situations that have happened the last few weeks, and, and there's this race conversation happening right now. Um, last week or two weeks ago, Ahmaud Arbery was killed uh, by a couple of men as he was going through this neighborhood. He was unarmed, and now this week, a man was pinned to a ground, and, and an officer holding his knee on his neck, the man suffocated to death as they arrested him. And I gotta be honest with you, like in the past, 
when I would see these things, I would respond with, well, let's wait till all the details come out. Like, let's wait. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything. Let's wait until, until we, we have all the details. And rather than responding with a heart that's broken for our brothers and sisters of color who feel like this is an all too regular occurrence in their life. And so I actually want to invite you because next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, actually, we're going to have a conversation on racial reconciliation and the gospel and, and how we as Christians should respond in this time. But I'm saying this to you because I think that in the past, my mindset was different, but I believe that God has begun to open my eyes more spiritually to the empathy and the heart that I should have for my brothers and sisters of color who feel marginalized and overlooked, who feel mistreated in this world and in this culture, and that we need to be a voice of grace and love and justice alongside of them. But it takes admitting that we're blind. Third, the secret to really seeing is community. Now, you all know that this word of community, it ends with the word unity. You don't have unity without community. And here in verse 22, we see that they come to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. You see, spiritual growth is only exercised in community. People help us recognize our spiritual blindness. That's why we need people. We need people to keep it real with us, keep it 100 with us. We have to, to have friends in order to see. And this man, thank God, he had friends that begged Jesus and brought him to Jesus so that he could see. Imagine if he didn't have these friends. Imagine if these people weren't in his life. He'd still be blind. He would have walked through this life blind. But it said, some people brought him. And man, I don't know about you, but I... I need some people in my life. These are some good people. They didn't just bring them to Jesus. They begged Jesus to heal him. We need community. There's a song, you know, it's a, it's a song, a Drake song and DJ Khalid song called No New Friends. And, uh, and, and I think some of you have heard this song. And, and I know some people, I have friends who this is their mantra. They're like, no new no friends, no new no friends. Like, that's, they, they sing that, they live that. But I just want to, man, I want to challenge you in that because I think um, if we walk through this life with that mentality, I think we're missing out on some people who God may be bringing along our path to challenge us and to help us grow, to help us see clearly. My wife, I got to be honest, like, um, sometimes I give her a hard time when I, when I preach, but... She's helped me to see things that I would have never seen without her. I was spiritually blind in a lot of areas of my life. And God has used my wife, my community, right? He's used my wife to open my eyes to see things that before I didn't see. And, and he's used her to help heal my blindness. And I'm so thankful for that. And I just got to ask you, like, do you have a community of people that you know are going to help you see more clearly. My daughter, I was thinking about her because uh, we've been, you know, it's been hot the last few days and um, we've been swimming. My parents have a pool and they're not far from us. So we head on over there. And last year, my daughter, she hated swimming, terrified to swim. And she would, every time it was swim time at my parents' house, she'd just go, I'll take a nap. You know, she was four at the time. She's five now. And uh, she did not want to swim ever. And it, it was like such a bummer to us because my boys love swimming and our whole family loves swimming. And she was always missing out. And so one day I realized, well, we don't have goggles for her. So I'm going to go get her some goggles, some nice girly pink goggles. And maybe the pink goggles will make her want to swim. And so I got her the goggles and she was like, okay, daddy, I'll try to swim. She put on the goggles and she jumped in the water and it was like something clicked. Something changed. Suddenly... She loved to swim. And you know what she said to me when she got out of the water? She got out after that first time swimming. She didn't say, oh, they're so cute and pink. She said, daddy, I can see. Daddy, 
I can see. What I realize is that the blurred vision she had while swimming was giving her a less than ideal experience. And because of the experience, she wanted nothing to do with it. And I wonder how many people have a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to church, when it comes to God, and they think, oh, it's because the church is jacked up. They think, oh, it's because it's because there's all these hypocrites in the church. Oh, they think it's because all oh, man-made religion. And they blame all this other stuff. But I wonder if it's, if it's not the church, but maybe it's their vision. Maybe it's them that needs more clarity. And if they had clarity of sight, they'd walk in and realize that, hey, maybe I'm more like these people than I thought. And maybe the church isn't so bad. And maybe God wants to teach me something by being a part of this community. You see, what my daughter was doing was blaming the pool and the experience as the problem, but really it was her vision that was the problem. And I think maybe there's somebody out there listening to this right now and you've written off the church and you've written off community and you've written off the believers, the body of believers, and, and you said they're all hypocrites. But maybe it's you that needs to get with God and needs to say, I, I need some clarity of sight. And maybe it's the community that's going to help you to see clearly. Fourth and finally, the secret to really seeing is a repeated touch. From Jesus. You see, we look at verse 24, 25. It says, and he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored. He saw everything clearly, and he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. So what happened was this man needed not just one touch, but another touch from Jesus. It wasn't just the first touch that healed him. It was the second touch that healed him. And I just wanted to tell you this because I think we're all on a journey. Coming to salvation doesn't mean you've arrived at the end of the road. Becoming a church member doesn't mean you're all set. No, spiritual sight must be pursued. Spiritual clarity and seeing clearly is a pursuit, and it's one that we must be after daily, drawing closer to Jesus, getting a fresh touch from Jesus. And I wonder how many of us have been walking through this life, and we think we've arrived, we think we've got it all figured out, and we've forgotten that, no, I need a fresh touch from Jesus every single day, every single moment, or I'm never going to see the way he wants me to see. Verse 31 I'm jumping forward, and uh, there's this moment. Actually, I'm going to go to verse 27 first. This moment where Jesus is on this journey with his disciples, and he actually goes to Caesarea Philippi, and if you know anything, so he leaves this, um, you know, the Sea of Galilee, the north tip of Galilee, and uh, Bethsaida, and then they take this 25-mile trip up to Caesarea Philippi. And it's named Caesarea Philippi because um, they named it after Julius Caesar, and then Herod named it after one of his sons, whose name was Philip. And so they named it Caesarea Philippi. And they're on their way to this spot. And again, this whole chapter is about spiritual blindness. And Jesus asked the disciples, he said to them, he says, who do you say that I am? And they told him, they said, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others, one of the prophets. And then he asked them this question. He says, but who do you say that I am? He says, who do you say? And Peter, in a moment, responds and says, you are the Christ. Now, if we actually look at Matthew chapter 16, um, verse 13 through 17, I'm not going to go there, but it's an account of this same story, but it's a, there's a little more details. And, and Jesus actually says, when, when Peter responds and says, you're, you're, you're the Christ, he responds and says, this has not come from man, but from God. He says, a touch from God gave Peter this clarity. And I was thinking about this. I'm like, man, this is a powerful moment where Peter acknowledges, like he said what the disciples were afraid to say. And the disciples have been watching Jesus. They've been seeing Jesus. They've been watching him work. And I think a lot of you out there, you've been seeing Jesus work in your life. You've seen him sustain you. He's brought you this far. But you haven't been able to just come out and say it. 
And Peter, in a moment when God touches him, he says, you are the Christ. And Jesus is ecstatic, like you finally see. You see. And then he goes on in verse 31 through 33, and he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So man, this story, like, there's a lot of twists and turns here. So Jesus says this four times before he goes to the cross. He tells the disciples, the son of man must suffer, must die, and then he'll rise again three days later. Four times he says this leading up to the cross. So what does Peter do? Peter follows up. I mean, we're talking moments later, maybe hours later. An amazing moment of seeing with another moment of blindness. And I think we can all relate to this. I know I can relate to this. Because there are moments when I'm like, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit has fallen on me and the glory is all around me. And I see clearly and God uses me. And then an hour later, I'm blind again. An hour later, I'm in a fight with my wife, right? I'm arguing with her. Moments after a touch from God and spiritual you know, clarity is spiritual blindness. And this is the curse of being human. This is the challenge of being human. But this is why we need a repeated touch from Jesus. Because we follow up clarity with blindness. We follow up seeing with blindness. I can see, but now I can't. Or I can see, but it's like trees. I don't see clearly. So I want to tell you, just because you see one moment doesn't mean you won't be blind the next. And I'm not just talking to someone who doesn't know God. I'm talking to you Christians out there. Just because you see one moment does not mean you won't be blind the next. That's why we need a continual touch from Jesus. A continual touch from the Holy Spirit. So what does Peter do? He actually takes Jesus by the arm, it says. He takes him to the side to rebuke him. And I just picture this, like Peter, and I do this to my kids, like when they're acting the fool, whether it's in a restaurant or, or when they're around like fr fr friends or family, when, when they get out of line, they get out of pocket, as the kids say, like I grab them by the arm, I'm like come with me, right? Y'all done this. It, you, you real parents out there, like I'm like, come with me, right? Grab them by the arm, I drag them over, and then we have a conversation, right? I put them in their place. I check them. And I just imagine Peter's trying to do this to Jesus. He's like, come with me, Jesus. Like, I got, I got to put you in your place. Like, you're not, that's not going to happen. Like, no, you're not going to die. That's, that's not going down. And this is what Peter does. And what does Jesus do? He has to rebuke him in this moment in front of the disciples. You see, the greater your potential to be used by God, the greater your potential to be used by the enemy too. What does that mean? That God has created us with gifts and we are walking, living weapons. And this is going to encourage some of you men out there because you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm tough. Like, you are a weapon. But you're a weapon for either good or evil. You're a weapon. But it all comes down to your positioning. And what I mean by that is are we humble people? Because humble people know that they don't always see clearly. They know that even when they do, the next moment, they might be blind. They know that without Jesus, they will walk, you know, in, in blindness much of their life. And what I see in this generation, I just got to be honest with you, like what I see on social media and Facebook and this generation is an arrogance and a pride unlike any other. And I think it's rising up in all of us, and I want to call us on it, on it and challenge us on it. You see, we think we can see better than everyone else. And so on social media, all I see is people, you know, um, going back and forth and posting their opinions and bashing churches and bashing pastors and bashing politicians. And, and, and we've lost all social discourse. And, and why? Because we're so arrogant, we think we know everything. We think we know. And I want to tell you, until we humble ourselves, 
and come to God and say, I need a touch from you to truly see we're going to walk with blurred vision. We think we can see, but we really can't. We're blind. Our vision is blurred. I see, but most of us are walking through life. We're saying, I see. But if we were honest, we're like, well, I, I, I see shapes. I see. I know what needs to happen. Well, but honestly, like men look like trees. I see, but. You see, we look at Peter's life and Peter is just like us. I relate a lot to Peter. I think a lot of you do because of the choices he made. One moment of clarity and vision and seeing in the next moment of blindness. You see, Peter, he needs a touch here in this moment. God touches him and he says, you're the Christ. And then a few months later or a few minutes later, he's rebuking Jesus and saying, no, far be it from you, Lord, that's not going to happen. And he needs another touch. When he denies Christ three times in his greatest moment of need, even though Jesus warns him, he says, no, I won't deny you three times. He needs a touch. When he leaves the ministry to go back to fishing in John 21 because Jesus has been crucified and buried, he needs another touch. On the day of Pentecost, when he preaches in front of 3,000 people, he needs another touch. When he's at Cornelius' house and, and he's... He's going, no, God, like this, this message is only for the Jews. And God is speaking to him through a dream and saying, no, it's for the Gentiles too. It's for all mankind. He needs another touch, another touch. Just because we see clearly in one area of our life doesn't mean we will see clearly in all areas of our life. And so I want to challenge us today, church, that we would continually seek a repeated touch from Jesus because that is the only way to really see we are spiritually blind and I'm not just saying you I'm saying me we are spiritually blind and unless every day we get a touch from Jesus we walk through this life saying I see but not really I see but it's really shapes I see, but I don't see the full picture. And God wants you to see with clarity. He wants you to have clarity of vision for your family, for your future, for your dreams, for your kids, for generations to come, for what the church should look like. God wants you to have clarity of vision. And it only comes when Jesus touches us every single day. So I ask you, I, I implore you, that right now in this moment, wherever you are, I wish we were having church in person because I'd be giving an old-fashioned altar call. Come on forward. You need a touch from Jesus. It doesn't matter if you've been with him your whole life or for a few days or weeks. We all need a touch from Jesus every day. Why? So we can see clearly. So I can say, I see. Like this blind man, it was trees. And then suddenly he had complete clarity of sight. That's what God wants to give, give to you. But it has to happen every day. So today I want to pray for us. I want to pray that today, wherever you are, in your living room, on your couch, watching on a phone, on a device, that you would encounter God and that God would touch you so you have clarity of sight. But then every day moving forward, you'd wake up and say, God, let me see the way you want me to see. Give me your eyes. Give me clarity of vision. I don't want to walk just seeing shapes, just seeing men like trees. I want to see the way you want me to see. So I want to pray for us today. But I also want to pray for you out there if you don't know Jesus, if you've never surrendered your heart to him, you know that you have been spiritually blind for years or decades, and today you want to see for the first time ever. God wants you more than ever right now to respond to him, to salvation, to receive his son, Jesus Christ, as your savior. That's all it takes, and you'll see. Blind eyes opened. And let me tell you, it is the best life. So if that's you and you need Jesus today, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. If you need to receive Jesus for the first time, you need to recommit yourself to him. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to see clearly. I ask you today to come into my life, to make me new, to wash me clean from the inside out. I love you, Jesus. I confess with my mouth that you are the Savior that you are the Lord, and that you rose again. I love you, Jesus, in your name. 
Amen. Amen. We're celebrating with all of you that just prayed this prayer. If you did uh, respond to this, to salvation, I'd ask you to click the link below, fill it out, let us know so we can connect with you and help you grow in this journey of faith. But I want to pray over the rest of us Christians out there right now. I think a lot of us are spiritually blind. And I think this season, this uh, COVID-19 season, quarantine, I think it's actually blinded us more. I think it, pride and arrogance and, and, and fear and, and stress and anxiety, we're a little spiritually blind right now. And God wants to open our eyes to see clearly. And so I wanna pray for you, I wanna pray for me that God would give us spiritual clarity. He would let our eyes see the way he wants us to see. So Lord, I pray for your church. I know that maybe some things in this message um, rubbed, rubbed them the wrong way and I, I pray that they did in a way that made them uncomfortable, that they would begin to say, God, I wanna see more clearly. I wanna change, I wanna come closer to you. So God, let us see with your eyes. Give me spiritual clarity. Give them spiritual clarity. God, we want spiritual vision for our life. We want the secret to seeing. We know that's found in you and you alone. So God, may we walk away from this message, say, I see and I actually see. Not I see, but. Lord, we see and we truly see. We don't just see shapes. We see with clarity. Lord, today we ask for a touch from you. All of us Christians that are a mess and, and messed up and walking through this and trying to figure it out, God, give us clarity of sight. May we love the way you've called us to love. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, church, we love you. Stay tuned in a moment for the update on everything coming up, our uh, reopening plan reconnecting plan, regathering plan. We're so excited for what God's gonna do. We love you guys, we're praying for you. We'll see you soon, God bless you. Hey church, we hope that you were encouraged and challenged by this weekend's uh, service and we really do miss you. We miss gathering together, but here's the thing, church is not confined to a building or physical gathering. We believe that church happens throughout the week, not just over the weekend. And so we want you to know though, that we look forward to regathering and we do have a plan for when that time does come. Yes, so the regathering plan that you have been waiting for this whole service, <laughs> you're on pins and needles. Here's what's going down. First, we've been in communication with the Crest and we believe that is a real option that we can meet there uh, in the foreseeable future. However, the Crest has submitted a reopening plan to the city and they're waiting to hear back. So while they wait, we wait. So as of now, we cannot meet at the Crest, but as soon as they say we can and they get word back from the city, we are planning on having in-person services, regathering at the Crest um, for the next few weeks. Now, it will only be a few weeks, because our building is only a few weeks away from being done. So we believe our building will be done around the middle of July. And so that will be where we are from now on, right? Well, as soon as it opens. So we want you to know the Crest is an option, but there is the chance that we could be waiting until our building is open if they don't get the go ahead. Now, some of you in West Sac are going, what about Stonegate Elementary? Uh, schools are off limits at this time. We don't see them opening in the foreseeable future. So as of now, we are uh, one campus. Our two campuses have been brought together. So we may be meeting at the Crest in the next few weeks. Uh, we may be waiting until the building is done the middle of July. Either way, we're only a few weeks away. And uh, we cannot wait to gather in person with you. We'll be following all the guidelines, um, everything that our governor has mandated for us. Um, we are preparing our team, our volunteers, and we cannot wait to gather in person with you very soon. But don't forget that church is not just on Sundays or over the weekend. Church is throughout the week, so we still have opportunities for you to be the church and stay connected to the community of the church. The yes. community of our church is the heart of the church, is the heartbeat of the church, so when we gather throughout the week, we are encouraged and are strengthened in our faith, so make sure that you jump into an online group. They happen throughout the week. Um, many options for you, so please make sure. Jump online, projectchurch.com slash group groups and jump into the community and heart of the church. Hey, we can't wait to see you. We know we'll be gathering soon in person. Yes. It's going to be incredible. We believe revival is going to break out. Yeah. God's going to yeah. move. But in the meantime, he's been moving online yes. and we're going to continue to have church online for the next few weeks. We love you guys. We're praying you. for you. God bless you. you.